Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, if you're in Europe. Um, welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Duncan Wood. I am the Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives here and the Interim Director of the Global Europe Program. This event organized by the Global Europe Program in collaboration with our friends at the Kennan Institute and, of course, the delegation of the European Union here in Washington, D.C. Sincere thanks to our friends at the delegation. We look forward to working more closely with you in the future on diverse projects. Today, we're delighted to be hosting this conversation between Robin Quinville, good friend of the Global Europe Program, and former Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge d'Affaires at the US Embassy in Berlin, and Stefano Sanino, the Secretary General of the European External Action Service of the European Union, on the issue of the European Union, the US, and NATO Partners for Global Security. President Biden's speech this past weekend has captured many of the headlines here in the United States, but the real hard work and most consequential events and conversations actually took place in the preceding days in the president's meetings with European and other NATO partners. This today is an opportunity to look at those conversations and agreements and to understand their significance moving forward. We ask you, the audience, to participate in this event by sending your questions to our Twitter account, which is at Wilson Center GEP, or our email account, GEP at wilsoncenter.org. Let me introduce our panelists here. Robin Quinville entered the US Foreign Service in 1988. After initial assignments in Germany and Washington, she served as a, a member of the US delegation to the OSCE in Vienna between, between 92 and 96. From Vienna, she was then posted to the US mission to NATO headquarters in Brussels, where she worked on issues related to NATO enlargement. She has been the Office Director for Western European Affairs at the Department of State between 2015 and 2017. She's also been a, a State Department Fellow at the Wilson Center and she holds an MA and MPhil in European history from Columbia University in New York. Robin, welcome to the Wilson Center. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stefano Salino is the Secretary General of the European External Action Service since the 1st of January, 2021. He held the post of Deputy Secretary General for Economic and Global Issues from April, 2020 to December, 2021. From March, 2016 to April, 2020, he was ambassador of Italy to Spain and Andorra um, between uh, 2013 and 2016, he held the position of permanent representative of Italy to the EU in Brussels. After a period at the cabinet of the president of the commission, he joined the Directorate General for External Relations as Director for Crisis Management and Representative at PSC, then Director for Latin America, and finally as Deputy Director General for Asia and Latin America. He then moved on to the Director General for Enlargement as Deputy Director General and later as Director General a position he held until June of 2013. Um, he has been a diplomatic advisor to the Italian Prime Minister, has held various positions with the Italian Diplomatic Service, and we are absolutely delighted, Mr. Sanino, to have you here with us today. I look forward to this uh, conversation between true experts, and for that reason, I am now going to withdraw, turn off my camera, and turn it over to Rob. Over to you. Thank you so very much. I too am very honored to have this opportunity, Mr. Secretary General, and I think it, it could not be more timely. We have seen an absolute drumbeat of diplomacy and action over the last weeks, as we're seeing this war in Ukraine that is changing Europe and changing how we face the strategic challenges ahead. And I look at that drumbeat and I see that we have worked to me be as close as humanly possible on all of the actions that we are taking. First, to prepare those actions, to signal those actions, and then to take those actions, uh, not only here in the US, in NATO, and in the EU. And it has been an impressive amount of coordination. Just thinking back to in the course of the last couple of months, we have seen the NATO Defense Ministerial, we've seen discussions at the Munich Security Conference, including with EU officials. We have had numerous bilateral contacts and bilateral outreach to Russia to, to highlight our concerns in advance of their action in Ukraine. We have seen the NATO foreign ministers meet on March 4th and NATO defense ministers on March 16th. And then finally, of course, we have seen la at the end of last week, NATO summit, the president's participation in the EU Council. This, these are all efforts where we have said, here is what we are doing and underscored what we are doing together as partners. And it has been remarkable, including in the speed of action. 
um, I, I looked at the, the results of the council, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more from your perspective as well. And what I saw was an emphasis on practical problem solving. And that was true in a couple of senses. First, from the, from the agreements that the president and the, and, uh, and the EU have highlighted together. So for example, energy security measures to take in that field, uh, the, uh, the update to what was once called privacy shield so that we are able to have our data flow uh, and support our transatlantic business and looking at changed force postures in the, uh, on NATO's eastern flank. So much of this is all work that we are doing and coordinating together. And what really struck me was that this was also the point at which the EU approved its strategic compass, which a project that was long in the making and was to be farsighted and look ahead and create tools and yet is presented in the now where there is a need for speed for these tools. And you've set yourself an ambitious agenda with the strategic, strategic compass. And I think it will be even more ambitious in that people are going to want to see some of these tools available as soon as possible. So there is a, there is a real uh, in immediacy to what you have in fact negotiated and uh, and put together. And this is our opportunity to talk a little bit about the new tools that you are giving for the uh, for the coordination and the uh, problem solving, the practical problem solving that we want to do together. So with that, could I ask you to perhaps introduce some of that in uh, to us, and then we will have an opportunity for a few questions. I'll I have a couple. Uh, but also, we're going to encourage questions from our vibrant audience that I know contains many experts. So I want to make sure that I say this again, and I'm going to repeat it every once in a while. For vibrant discussion, please send your questions to gep at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet us at at Wilson Center GEP, and that's GEP for Global Europe Program. So with that, Mr. Secretary General, may I turn it over to you? Robin, thank you very much. And thanks to uh, Duncan and to the Wilson Center for hosting uh, uh, this event. I think that um, um, it's a very good moment to uh, um, have this discussion. Uh, um, let me, uh, as a way of introduction, and I really hope that we can have a dialogue to uh, highlight, uh, let's say, three main moments. Uh, and and uh, you have already mentioned uh, um, them, but to uh, stress first how uh, uh, closely uh, we have worked on the two, side, uh, the two sides of the Atlantic in uh, um, the last months. This has been, uh, um, I have to say, we often, often speak about unprecedented, but uh, it's really unprecedented in the sense that uh, never have we uh, managed to uh, get a sense of uh, um, closeness and of common work like the ones that we've experienced in, the, in these last few months. I think that it's been a strategic choice on, on both sides. Uh, um, we have tried to uh, uh, not to overcome the differences eh? because I mean, as in every uh, competitive environment, uh, we have to be able to, uh, 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 to move uh, and to compete, let's say when it comes to our economic systems, but there is a sense of uh, a common purpose that uh, um, we have identified and which we have worked very intensively at, the, at different levels. And I think that this has been uh, extremely uh, um, relevant uh, and uh, visible in, uh, um, and that's my second point, in the sanction package that we have agreed uh, um, uh, following the uh, uh, aggression of Russia to Ukraine, where we have worked very intensively for uh, um, uh, many weeks. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we have really come up with a joint package, which has proved to be uh, extremely uh, effective and with a very strong impact on uh, on uh, on Russia. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the aggression of Russia to Ukraine uh, um, has generated a, <coughs> a sense 
a need of a, a unity uh, uh, within the European Union and between the European Union and, uh, and the United States, and I would say the transatlantic community more in general, because other countries have joined us in, uh, um, uh, in, in, from that point of view. Um, uh, and from a, a certain point of view, uh, uh, in, in Europe, it has been quite uh, uh, unique how we have managed very easily to, uh, um, again, to uh, uh, agree on uh, uh, this very substantial uh, um, uh, package of sanctions, but also on the decision to use uh, our financial instruments to uh, support the uh, supply of arms to uh, Ukraine uh, to defend and, uh, against the attack. That's also something that it uh, uh, had not done before. Has, and that's the other important element to underline, the uh, um, opening of our borders to the flow of refugees, the more than a three and a half million refugees that have come to, uh, um, to Europe and they've created a, uh, in just a few weeks, and that have created this uh, uh, very strong sense of solidarity, but also a legal framework that we had never used before to uh, give essentially all these refugees the same treatment that uh, uh, our nationals would have. So uh, from all points of view, a, a, a quite a unique sense of, um, um, of purpose, um, once again, together with you and within the uh, uh, European Union. And during the same period, as you uh, um, rightly said, we have also um, um, gone through the approval process of the strategic compass, which is somehow our um, security and defense white book, what we would like to do uh, uh, in the uh, uh, coming uh, five to 10 years. Um, it, is a, it has been a very substantial work that uh, um, has lasted uh, for two years of preparation of, say, bringing uh, um, all our member states uh, uh, reading on, on, on the same page. And the uh, strategic compass uh, is, a, um, uh, in a way, we, we always say that it's very ambitious on the one hand, but also a very uh, realistic and uh, actionable uh, um, set of uh, uh, measures. We identified uh, um, 60 uh, uh, different concrete actions with the specific timeline uh, um, to, uh, uh, to implement them. Um, and we have structured and organized the work of a strategic compass around four main chapters. One, the action that we want to, uh, um, uh, to take, so how to uh, uh, intervene in a hostile environment with the possibility of having a rapid deployment capabilities of up to 5,000 5, uh, um, uh, uh, persons um, in order to uh, uh, be able to intervene in different scenarios that uh, uh, may occur. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, also strengthening uh, uh, the uh, uh, military mobility capacity, so the, uh, the capacity of all the uh, uh, our uh, military uh, um, uh, troops and, and, and uh, um, uh, mechanisms to uh, move around Europe more easily. The second chapter is one of uh, um, this, the, the, securing the, the ability to anticipate and to uh, respond to hybrid threats, uh, to cyber attacks. So I mean, the, uh, how this dimension, uh, um, which was not so developed up until now, and, but has become an essential part, part of the uh, um, uh, security of, uh, um, of our continents, um, could be uh, uh, developed. Um, so how to fight hybrid hybrid campaigns, how to uh, um, counter cyber threats, uh, foreign interference, manipulation of information, um, and creating a, a toolbox and policy framework that could allow us to, uh, um, to uh, um, counter this. And then the third chapter on investment, uh, so which are the areas where we can invest in defense capabilities, um, which are the uh, uh, 
the, uh, the gaps that needs to be uh, filled in order to uh, be more effective. Um, and I want to stress that uh, uh, the capabilities, the, invest the, 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 the military capabilities will remain, will belong to the member states. We are not speaking here about creating a, a new European structures, but to facilitate our member states to uh, develop these plans. And, the, and uh, on the basis of single set of forces, these uh, capabilities can be used both in a NATO environment on an European Union environment. So in a way, it's a way of strengthening also the uh, um, NATO um, uh, uh, alliance and the, the participation of the European Union to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to NATO. Finally, the fourth chapter on uh, partnerships, which are our partners with which we want to uh, uh, do uh, uh, this work. And that's essentially our partners of uh, uh, privileged partners, certainly uh, NATO, which remains uh, the uh, cornerstone of the security of the transatlantic security. Um, but in a way, we want also to uh, um, uh, stress and highlight the complementarity between European Union and NATO and how, and we have seen also in, in, a, in a way, how the uh, uh, processes of the EU can help and facilitate the work of NATO and, uh, and vice versa. Um, so also from, from that point of view, uh, uh, we thought that the, uh, uh, this approach can uh, uh, be extremely uh, uh, relevant to uh, uh, the overall security uh, uh, in the, uh, the transatlantic um, uh, sphere and uh, uh, generate a um, capacity to react in a world that has become much more dangerous. Uh, in the, uh, and the High Representative Borrell, uh, um, a few months ago, unfortunately, uh, was rightly saying that Europe is in danger. He was seeing, the, uh, uh, in a way, the, the, the uh, perspective of uh, uh, the threats that would, it would come. All this work is based on a threat assessment, which has been done by um, our intelligence services of the 27 member states. Uh, there too, it's quite interesting because you can see that from, from different uh, uh, member states and from different geographical perspectives, you can have a, a, a quite broad uh, uh, pictures. And uh, uh, certainly the, uh, uh, the threat coming from Russia um, was highlighted already uh, uh, there. We have then updated this uh, 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 threat assessment uh, following the, uh, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the attack to Ukraine. But it remains the, uh, uh, this overall, uh, again, overall approach um, and the, uh, the determination of the European Union to uh, uh, participate and to be a security provider in, uh, uh, in trying to defend and guarantee the security of our societies. I think that you're muted, Robin. How about that there? Much better. There we go. <laughs> So I was struck by the fact that the, stri the strategic compass began with the words that it did. And it, said, it begins with the return to war in Europe. And it struck me that this has significantly influenced the strategic compass in a way that it might not have begun uh, in the last year, had it been issued in the fall of 2021, for example. And in, within the project, you have now established a rapid reaction force. And that is something that is a, a very new step, it seems to me. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the present situation influenced the drafting of the document that uh, that came out in the last week. Yes, first of all, allow me to uh, um, um, to 
let's say, specify that with more than the rapid reaction force, we were creating the rapid reaction capabilities. It's not a standing force. So essentially, uh, it's more the, uh, um, the capacities of member states to uh, uh, pull together uh, forces uh, in order to intervene in uh, specific situations. It's not a minor uh, uh, difference because somehow we are, uh, what we want to do is to generate a capacity to intervene in specific circumstances. So it, um, um, uh, the interoperability of the forces, the capabilities of uh, uh, working together, live exercise, in, in, in control and capability mechanism, all these are elements that will be there, but we are not speaking about the standing force. Huh? Um, and that's also important because uh, um, we do not want to uh, um, create crowding out effects and, 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 uh, uh, and we do not want to duplicate what is being done also in the, uh, uh, in the NATO context. Um, uh, this was, I would say, uh, uh, one of the main assumptions, one of the main uh, um, ideas of the, uh, the strategic compass, and uh, it came uh, before, uh, let's say, the crisis in, uh, um, in Ukraine. Um, it was more um, um, the determination to be able to intervene in specific cases uh, um, in a hostile environment, uh, um, if you have to, uh, as it happened, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, this summer in Afghanistan, if you have to extract uh, uh, your uh, citizens or European citizens from a, a specific place, or if you have to intervene uh, um, in order to uh, um, facilitate a certain uh, um, process on the ground, uh, so the idea uh, was very much that of uh, uh, having the possibility of intervening in uh, a theater where NATO could not or would not be able to intervene for uh, uh, different circumstances. Um, and I, again, I insist on also on this point, we are not speaking here about uh, doing the work that NATO is doing. We are very clear that when it comes to the uh, uh, security uh, in Europe, the uh, uh, Article 5, uh, um, there is nothing that uh, uh, cannot be done outside, uh, outside NATO. But there are in regional theaters, in specific circumstances, uh, moments when for NATO it would be more difficult and where the uh, uh, European dimension can uh, help uh, and can facilitate, let's say, uh, decisions to, uh, uh, to be present militarily on the ground. Mm -hmm. I, it was one of a very long list to-do list that you have assigned yourself uh, with timelines in this in this document, and some of them are for this year. Uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about some of the priorities that you have to achieve in, say, the next the, in the course of the 2022 with some of these things? Because really, it is a, a very ambitious program. And I urge people to take a look at it. Um, uh, well, essentially, uh, uh, looking at different chapters uh, uh, on uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the chapter of uh, uh, act, of the action that we need to take, we will need to work on uh, uh, creating the conditions for um, uh, this rapid uh, um, deployment capabilities to uh, um, uh, to be able to, uh, um, to come in. So uh, the idea is that of defining, first of all, which are the scenarios mm -hmm. uh, under which this could happen. This is, a, a, I would say, partly a theoretical exercise, but it's uh, also, I mean, it can take into account the experience that we have developed over years. I just want to remind that uh, um, we have now active on the ground 18 operations and missions that are already uh, in, uh, uh, mainly in Africa, but also in the Middle East or in, uh, um, in Eastern Europe. 
So uh, uh, to uh, define, first of all, the scenarios, and then to start defining which are the uh, uh, specific elements that we need in terms of control and capabilities to uh, uh, generate this, uh, um, uh, this force. Um, that's the, uh, the, the first thing. The second point about the, uh, um, uh, the secure, so the, the area of uh, uh, hybrid uh, um, and uh, uh, cyber, um, we want to uh, uh, better define our hybrid toolbox. We have already a certain number of mechanisms in place, but we want to be sure that uh, uh, this toolbox is even more effective. And if I may uh, put it, quite clearly that can also uh, generate some consequences if some actors, state or non-state actors are using uh, um, uh, cyber attacks or uh, hybrid attacks. Um, so to uh, have a, a more stringent uh, um, a set of tools in, uh, at our disposal to, uh, uh, to be able to intervene in this sector. Um, the third, in the third chapter, in the investment chapter, we will have uh, by uh, uh, the month of May a first uh, assessment of the uh, uh, gaps that uh, exist in our defense systems. And on the basis of this assessment, we will determine then which are the plans that we want to uh, develop. Um, and uh, which are the conditions under which the European Union can intervene in order to facilitate the uh, uh, come together of the different member states uh, in areas like joint procurement or like um, uh, uh, exempting uh, uh, VAT for uh, uh, investment in the, um, in the defense sector. And finally, in the partnership, we really uh, um, want to be sure that uh, uh, the partnership with NATO uh, and the partnership with the United States could really uh, uh, become tangible. Um, uh, NATO will have its own uh, um, strategic strategic concept approved uh, yeah. at the NATO summit in, uh, in Madrid. And then following that, we will need to, uh, teams will need to sit together and define, I hope, a common uh, uh, working plan for uh, uh, the, uh, the months and years to come. Um, and we hope also in the meantime, together with the United States, to launch a strategic dialogue on defense and security, which let's say which, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the main elements uh, have already been identified, but we need them now to operationalize this, uh, this dialogue. So I would say if we can manage by the end of the year to uh, get all these elements in place, I would be already quite happy uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, implementation of the timeline uh, uh, agreed in the uh, um, in the strategic uh, compass, and we will have also at the beginning of next year to revise the uh, threat assessment which had been prepared last year, but which was not taking into account the uh, uh, situation that has been generated by the Russian attack on Ukraine. Yeah, I had I had wanted to ask about that because you foresee also greater consultation between the EU and NATO and that uh, in in meetings and so forth. And you're stepping up meetings of your own defense ministers, I think. So so all of that are these are indications uh, of how the EU and NATO and the US will in fact be able to work together in this way. Uh, uh, one question that I know all of my colleagues here in Washington are asking is, so what does this mean for NATO, right? You know that they are asking this, and I'm sure that that people in Brussels, my colleagues there, have been, have been uh, asking you, what does this mean? And particularly when it comes to the investment scenario, because I think that it, what this makes clear is that it is uh, capabilities that count, right? And you are looking to to prompt that uh, investment in capabilities and indeed to do the assessment of capabilities that are necessary for robust defense. So I'll ask the question on, on behalf of all my Washington colleagues that are tuning in and listening to one ear while they're typing briefing memos with the other, right? What, tell me what, how you envisage this with NATO. And then 
as my follow-up question, it's, and what would you like to see in the NATO strategic concept? Well, I think that for NATO, and I, I really uh, uh, believe in this, I think that for NATO, this is good news. Mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, there is a, a commitment of uh, uh, European Union to um, facilitate the process uh, for member states to invest more in the defense sector, to uh, um, um, be more focused and structured in uh, the work that we are doing in, uh, in this area, and also to uh, contribute to the definition of the uh, um, strategic posture of the EU. It's something that, uh, to me, it's extremely positive for everybody, positive for the European mm -hmm. Union, positive for NATO, and if I may, positive for the stability and security of the world. I mean, it's, uh, um, and that's really, in a way, the, uh, uh, the bottom line. I understand that uh, um, uh, there is a little bit of uh, um, uh, uncertainty about uh, what the European Union can become in the future. Uh, but I want to stress once again, and I've done uh, several times, that the European Union uh, is not and will never be an alternative to NATO. This is really not the point. I mean, uh, we want to be able to, uh, um, uh, first of all, to contribute to the security uh, in the context of NATO. And I was saying the investments that we will be doing will be uh, part of the uh, uh, set of forces that the member states will put at disposal of their own security, whether in a NATO context or in any EU context. Um, and uh, 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 this can only increase the uh, uh, effectiveness of, of NATO. If you look now at the uh, 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 expenditures and the contribution of the different participating uh, uh, countries to NATO, you will see that there is a, a huge imbalance between uh, what is being put by the uh, US and Canada and non-EU uh, countries and the countries of the European Union. So we need to rebalance that. I mean, it has always been said that we need to reach the 2% uh, 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 expenditure in, uh, uh, in defense. And this is, is happening. I mean, it's quite amazing in a way what has been decided by a number of uh, our member states, a bit Germany, but also countries like Denmark. Mm -hmm. The idea that, for example, a country like Denmark, which had opted out from all the defense area in the European Union, now has decided to hold a referendum in order to opt in and to join. Uh, so I think that from that point of view, uh, this is good news for, uh, for everybody. Um, uh, and if we have, uh, once again, speaking about competition, if we have uh, uh, a solid and uh, uh, more performing defense industry in uh, Europe, then again, I think that this is also good news. Uh, in the sense that uh, we will be able on the two sides uh, to work together, to compete constructively, as we have always done, and being able to uh, uh, produce better for the security of our countries. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, as it has been shown by uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, it's not only theoretical possibility. It's something that can happen and that has, as a matter of fact has happened. It has happened at the very border of the, uh, uh, the alliance, um, not only at the border of the European Union. And uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, we need to strengthen our posture. Certainly NATO has uh, uh, strengthened a lot its, uh, uh, its mm -hmm. posture. And in order to do that, we have, we have to have performing uh, uh, defense capacities on, on both sides. So for me, I only see advantages, once again, including unhealthy competition between Europe and US. <laughs> 
Well, I, I was interested to see that the focus on uh, strategic enablers and also developing uh, full, uh, full spectrum capabilities and so forth. I mean, it, there's, there's a level of specificity in this document that, su that suggests that the defense uh, investment will be robust uh, in order to reach those, those stated goals and in particular categories, again, in complementarity to NATO, which I also see as a, as a thread that runs throughout this document. Um, and there are also some, some issues like uh, infrastructure issues where, where investment in infrastructure to facilitate military mobility, for example, would also answer a need that NATO has often uh, identified and worked on. But I think that is, I, I fully agree with you, and I think that the point of military mobility is extremely important. And again, it's something that is important for uh, everybody. I mean, in a way, we have seen how the uh, logistic element is crucial, mm. uh, in, uh, unfortunately, in uh, a conventional war. Um, but I think that it's, uh, 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 again, it's one important part of the story, but it's, the only, it's not the only element of the story. And I think that uh, what the, the work that we are doing also in the context of uh, the uh, uh, so-called PESCO project, so the, uh, uh, the cooperation for a military project, or the uh, work that we have been doing that we are doing in the context of European Defense Agency in order to allow the United States to participate in, the, uh, in this project, it's a very important element. We need uh, to uh, um, say, we need to be able to uh, uh, work together and to uh, uh, overcome also in uh, the military sectors, uh, the barriers that we are trying to overcome in other sectors. Ideally, I would like to see in the future a, a dialogue on the defense industry between US mm. and, uh, and uh, Europe, the same way we are seeing now the uh, Trade and Technology Council, oh. where we are, let's say, um, trying to overcome uh, the mm. element, the rigidities of the systems in order to be more effective I mean, the, uh, uh, I always have always maintained that uh, we need this because we have outside challenges, let me put it this way, that we need to face. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we need to join forces. Yeah. I, I, I noticed there was some discussion of China in the, uh, in the strategic compass. Can you go into that a little bit further? Yeah, I mean, the China is the, uh, let's say, it's one of the other uh, major threats that has been identified in the context of the uh, uh, threat assessment that has been uh, that has been made. Uh, you know, it's uh, that the, uh, the European Union has a um, three prongs uh, um, approach to, uh, towards China. Well, we believe that China is a, a, a partner in some areas, is a competitor, and I would say that really it's, the competition is across the board in many other areas, not only economically, and then a, a systemic rival in certain areas where we disagree and a, a disagreement in, in, in our approach. Um, so in a way, uh, um, uh, we want to be sure that uh, even in, in the cases where uh, uh, China could possibly uh, uh, use instruments, uh, um, especially in terms of hybrid threats or, or mm. cyber threats, um, that we could be able to, uh, 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 to respond to that and also to ensure uh, the uh, um, possibility uh, uh, to control the outer space, uh, what is happening, for example, with uh, um, uh, satellites, which is mm. a, a very important part of the story. This is an area which has not been regulated up until now, and we need to see how to do it in a way that is not uh, uh, creating problems to the, uh, uh, to the our communications and security systems. Um, what to do in the maritime sector? Uh, there again, I mean, it's the uh, 
uh, we have a keen interest to have the uh, maritime routes uh, um, open and free. Uh, a lot of our trade goes through uh, uh, maritime routes, and they need to be uh, uh, to be defended. So uh, uh, all areas where, once again, we need to be sure that we have the uh, the instruments and the capabilities to. Uh, uh, respond or to avoid problems in case uh, there is a uh, not benign uh, attitude coming from uh, from east i also saw that you're going to look at uh, at uh, how you examine uh, foreign direct investment and uh, and uh, that is something that is that's also part of the of your strategy i believe Indeed, I mean, it's the, the point of uh, uh, the measures to avoid economic cohesion are extremely uh, uh, important. We are living uh, uh, in a world where essentially, um, call it weaponization or call it instrumentalization mm -hmm. of uh, uh, policies can happen. Mm -hmm. And when we see attacks which are being uh, uh, brought to uh, uh, our internal market or uh, which are obliging or try to oblige us to have a certain uh, uh, um, uh, posture or a certain attitude, then we want to be sure that we have instruments at our disposal. We did it for the security of our investments mm -hmm. to be sure that uh, in areas which are sensitive, uh, we are not going to be uh, again uh, instrumentalized. Um, and uh, we are doing and we are seeing also in other sectors. Let me put in a more general way. We are open societies, open economies, open societies, and we want to remain open. We do not want to become protectionist. We do not want to uh, uh, become uh, closed. But at the same time, uh, we should not allow uh, third parties to instrumentalize or to take advantage of our openness in order to uh, uh, hit us. And that's where we need to intervene. That's why it is important uh, in economic coercion or in the area of uh, manipulation of information that we can uh, develop instruments where we are able to uh, react. And even more, that we are able to anticipate dangerous behaviors. And that's, I mean, uh, it's, um, I'm not, I don't want to mention any specific country because it can come from everywhere. So it's, uh, but just again, we cannot let the, the openness of our societies become a, a weakness because the uh, great story about the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, autocratic societies are more efficient in protecting and defending our their citizens, we must be able to counter with facts. Mm. I think that your point on anticipation is a good one. It's the goal of in, including of the intelligence sharing that you are putting to capability that you're putting together also and stressing in the in the strategic compass. Um, I want to remind our listeners that for vibrant debate and an opportunity to challenge, I'm going to remind you that you can tweet your questions to us at uh, at Wilson Center GEP, that's GEP for Global Europe Program. And also, if you'd prefer to email GE, uh, GEP at wilsoncenter.org. So either would get us the, your questions and, and uh, allow us to put these to uh, the Secretary General. So. With that reminder, I'm going to go to something else that's in the that that you've talked about, and that is the importance of partnerships. And I noted in I noted that this is something where not only are we all, all working to provide the kind of humanitarian assistance and so forth that is so necessary for Ukraine and for those who are fleeing the war in Ukraine, but also the you are looking at other areas where the European Union. Uh, wants to to increase its work with partners and so forth. And I'd ask you to talk a little bit about that, maybe starting with the Western Balkans, which which appeared very much in that category. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think that the, the idea of the strategic compass is to uh, um, uh, look at the world that is entirety. I mean, I think that unfortunately, um, uh, threats can come from uh, uh, very far, not only from close to home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in a way, we need to be able to, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, to cyber, uh, 
distance doesn't matter too much. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, this is a sad reality. Um, but you're right, it is also true that in a way we need to be able to, uh, 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 to work uh, with the countries that are closer to us. And certainly the Western Balkans are the closest to the European Union um geographically but also politically i mean this is the region with which we have started already many years ago uh, uh, the enlargement process some of these countries have joined i mean uh, uh, croatia has joined the, uh, the european union with others we are negotiating uh, uh, since quite some time and with others we hope to be able to start negotiations soon so uh, Politically, certainly, this is an area where uh, uh, it, we look with a lot of uh, uh, attention uh, uh, in order to make it sure that once again, uh, uh, from a, secu a security point of view, but also from a political point of view, they uh, are part of, uh, um, of the uh, European uh, dimension of European, uh, European space. Um, uh, yeah. So we want, with the, we want to, uh, uh, to work with them. We are with some of them. We are, we're already working in a quite uh, uh, intense way. Politically, uh, there are countries that are fully aligned with uh, uh, our positions. Uh, that have also decided to join us, for example, in the uh, uh, sanctioning process to uh, uh, to Russia. And uh, uh, that is a sign of their willingness to be uh, really integrated into the uh, uh, European space. Then we have other countries in the region where we still have a number of challenges uh, uh, that we need to, uh, uh, to face. And uh, certainly uh, uh, we will need to keep on working. Uh, we do not want to uh, let them down or to let them behind. Uh, exactly because they are part of uh, this geographic space and we do not want to have let's say in the heart of the, our geographic space um, spots that are too soft and uh, uh, that can be influenced from outside mm -hmm. and can have a destabilizing effect in uh, um, in, uh, in the european union yeah the I'm going to pick up on the point about uh, destabilizing effects because I saw that uh, in one of the statements by Mr. Burrell that he talked about how there have been sort of three tectonic shifts. I think that tectonic shift is my word, but uh, uh, in the, with the 2008 financial crisis and then with the pandemic and now with war in Ukraine. And this has brought uh, a new uh, a new set of uh, of challenges and tools for for all of us, but particularly the EU. Do you sense it's reordering priorities, uh, or have you do you feel that this is something where your uh, your broad engagement will continue and that you will be able to to kind of continue on all fronts? Um, first of all, you are right that uh, I mean we have gone uh, through a number of uh, uh, crises and we have been uh, uh, living through a number of crises since now, I would say 15, 16 years in a row. That's a lot. I would add to uh, uh, these three crises that you have mentioned, also the migration crisis, mm -hmm. uh, which was also affecting a lot the uh, European Union and the Western Balkans. If you remember the, uh, the Balkan route, and uh, uh, it was extremely uh, uh, disruptive also for the stability of, uh, of these countries. So indeed, uh, it is true that all these elements have generated a sense of uh, insecurity, instability, uh, um, uh, both within the EU and uh, in, uh, in the countries of the, uh, uh, of the Western Balkans. Um, uh, that said, I mean, we, we think that it is important to continue working with, that, with them. I mean, it's not something that we can, uh, um, uh, how would they say, that we can uh, uh, put on the side when there is a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. On the contrary, when there is normally the, the problem are even if we have uh, a problem, they have a bigger problem <laughs> to face. <laughs> So in a way, uh, uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, 
to take this into account and to uh, uh, being able to provide a response to, uh, 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 to these countries. We speak a lot about the uh, geopolitics and the importance for the European Union to be geopolitics. Uh, looking at the neighbors and looking at other countries and looking at the external dimension is a very important part of this geopolitical dimension. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we run the risk of uh, uh, being uh, um, ego politics, looking at us <laughs> rather than at the others. <laughs> and that's something that we need to avoid. <laughs> It seems to me that 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 also just uh, shuts out the notion of anticipation if it's if you're always looking inward. So I I completely take your point, and you were very right to mention the migration crisis of uh, of 2015, and when I see 3.5 million refugees from Ukraine coming to Europe, you've done a lot to try and regularize uh, their reception. Talk to us a little bit about that, and what you're doing, and maybe how how you're applying lessons learned from 2015 to the to the situation today. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, let's say from that point of view, this, the, the machine of the solidarity in the European Union has worked a lot in, uh, in this um, um, last crisis. We have also um, um, used an instrument that we had at our disposal, but we had never used before, which is the uh, a temporary protection uh, status. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a possibility in the case of a crisis to, uh, again, to provide uh, refugees with uh, the uh, protection, uh, the same level of protection that you give to your own citizens. So to allow them to uh, uh, be able to enroll in schools, mm -hmm. to uh, use the, uh, um, the health system, uh, the uh, um, protection in terms of house and, and, and housing, um, help being helped to find a job and so on. So this has been uh, something that we had had for uh, quite some time, but we had never used before. And it has been, once again, about the fact that uh, when there is a political will, everything can happen. This was agreed in uh, a matter of days, so it's not even weeks. And that has been a very uh, uh, important uh, element because it has allowed essentially uh, the, uh, uh, all these uh, refugees to uh, uh, have easily uh, um, shelter, support, protection. And I mean, personally, we have seen it even here. I mean, you could see in some areas in, in here in Brussels where it, uh, they had come and uh, mm -hmm. uh, they were waiting for, uh, uh, for help. This has gone in a couple of days. So essentially everybody has been taken care of and this is, uh, and this is fantastic from that, from that point of view. So there is an element of solidarity which is very strong. In, from that point of view, uh, there is also an element uh, which has, uh, um, uh, let's say, played favorably. There were a lot of um, um, familiar or friendly links uh, mm -hmm. between uh, the two sides, uh, the different sides of the border, especially with Poland, which has been the country that has received most of the, uh, the refugees but also in, uh, in Romania, which has also, also been extremely open, in Moldova, mm -hmm. a country that in terms of uh, um, uh, population has also uh, been extremely uh, uh, receptive and generous, in, uh, uh, in Hungary, Slovakia, in the Czech Republic, I've seen that then people has progressively moved more into the, um, the European Union, uh, Germany, um, Italy, essentially all countries have hosted uh, uh, important uh, uh, communities uh, uh, of, let's say, refugees coming from, uh, from uh, uh, Ukraine. So from that point of view, uh, uh, I would say that the, uh, compared with the past, uh, we have seen a, a sense of um, maybe the closeness, and we cannot uh, uh, avoid saying this, Closeness has determined also a much more emotional reaction in the, uh, in the in the public opinions in Europe. Thank you. I've got a question from uh, from our colleague in the Global Europe Program, uh, Diana Negroponte, uh, and she asks: the strengthening of the eastern border will require more European troops. 
Uh, how should we anticipate the response of Southern European states? Will they be willing to consider conscription, for example? Um, tell me whether that has come up in your discussion. Well, I, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, I mean, at least, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, my feeling is that conscriptions uh, in Europe is something that uh, is maybe uh, um, not part of our culture, at least mm. in, in the last, uh, I, would, I don't know, 30 years I mean, it's mm. or so. Uh, but the professionalizations of the army uh, it has been, uh, uh, I think, a, a very important part of the story. So I suppose that professional uh, uh, soldiers or professional uh, uh, officials uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be part of the response to this. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting a flood of questions, so I'm going to give a couple of more of them. One of them is, is regarding the upcoming uh, EU-China summit, which I understand is happening, I think, April 1st. Uh, so the, a journalist from the South China Morning Post is asking, uh, do you expect this, uh, this summit to be a single issue summit? And how far will, it, will the EU push China regarding its perceived support for Russia? Well, I don't know if it's one uh, um, issue summit, but certainly uh, it will be a very political summit, not a business as usual summit. I think that the, uh, the uh, uh, Ukraine war will uh, certainly be uh, central in, uh, uh, in the discussion. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there will be, uh, I hope, I mean, I suppose, a, a, an open and, and, and frank discussion about uh, which is the role that China wants to have uh, on, on the world stage. I mean, uh, mm. uh, China has been, uh, in a way, neutral, uh, has uh, not declared, let's say, being part. They have abstained uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the vote of the General Assembly, in the uh, uh, different resolutions that have been passed in the last uh, um, a few weeks. Um, but they have also been, in a way, uh, um, quote unquote comprehensive about the reasons behind the intervention of uh, uh, Russia in Ukraine. Um, and that's something on which we will certainly be willing to, uh, 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 to have a discussion because uh, as I said also to my Chinese colleagues, um, I do not see, uh, I did not see NATO uh, aggressing Russia. I've seen Russia aggressing uh, uh, Ukraine. So between uh, some the possible intentions and the reality, uh, uh, there is a gap which is, uh, uh, has to be measured. Um, and then it's also about the, uh, uh, how to say, the uh, um, coherence of the uh, uh, position of, of China. China has always been uh, uh, supportive of the idea of uh, solving issues within in the context of the multilateral framework uh, uh, under the UN umbrella, uh, not using force. And uh, um, if I look what has happened uh, uh, in Ukraine, I think that this is not what uh, uh, China is always uh, advocating for. Mm -hmm. So I think that this will be part of uh, uh, this discussion, will be uh, part of the uh, uh, exchange. Um, and certainly uh, uh, we will be asking China to uh, 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 not to side with, uh, uh, with Russia, not to uh, use uh, its economy to circumvent sanctions. Um, and then the being supportive for the territorial integrity of, uh, uh, of Ukraine. Again, all things for which they have been uh, uh, very vocal uh, in uh, uh, the past years. I look forward to hearing the readout of the, uh, of the discussions that, uh, that take place on Friday. I'm sure we'll all be watching. Thank you. Let me, let me put another question from our, from our audience, and I know we're coming close to time, and again, Thank you for taking this time when I know it's your evening. Um, so let me, let me give you this one. Uh, you, uh, one of our questioners says, you mentioned not letting the openness of our societies become our weakness. 
in that light, what flexibility does and, uh, and what subsequent thinking exists within the EU for societies to curtail access to the internet or social media? Um, and the, the questions asked with the understanding of the connection between social media and security. Um, and I, I recall that sometimes this, this has been a very vigorous debate on both sides of the Atlantic. Perhaps you can tell us something about that debate within the EU. Look, and once again, I go back about the, uh, I would say, uh, freedom of expression, which I think that we are all extremely attached to, and then uh, uh, going beyond freedom of expression and then uh, um, using this uh, uh, instrument that we have at our disposal in order to uh, um, attack or in order to uh, uh, generate havoc. Um, and hence, we need to be able to, uh, uh, to control. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, like in a motorway, no? you uh, have the motorway and you can use it, but then there are rules on how to use it, because then, I mean, the, what you are doing may have an impact on the security of the others. So what is being done along the, the, uh, the motorway of our uh, uh, net, uh, um, it has to have, again, it's not a degree of control in terms of uh, reducing the freedom of expression, but if this is becoming an element to uh, limit the freedom of others, if the choice of others, then we need to be, uh, I think that we need to be able to uh, uh, intervene. And there is an element of, uh, Again, in the in the respect of the uh, of the uh, of the freedom of expression, uh, it's like when you are uh, um, attacking a person uh, on uh, on a newspaper or you are spreading lies about another one, you can go to justice and ask for uh, uh, mm. uh, for action to be taken uh, uh, by sp specific media. So I, I think that we need to be able to do that as well. And what we have done with uh, uh, Sputnik or Russia today, uh, essentially that we're uh, uh, spreading the lies, that they were conducting uh, uh, this information campaign, and then we have agreed that at a certain point, we did not want to, uh, this to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's, I think that we should not confuse the freedom of expression with the abuse that is done by some in order to use it as a weapon and to use it as an instrument against us. If you have time for a one final question. Sure. Uh, I know we are we are over our time, but uh, no. but I will I will toss it out there because it's actually a little bit linked to the last one, and because it's on cyber, which I know is a very big part of the uh, what the strategic compass is looking ahead to, and it's about the question of threshold. Do, how, how do you establish or have you established a threshold at which you not only would be willing to um, to attribute attacks, but to to take action against attacks, and I, I believe that that's the crux of the of this question, um, as cyber attacks, as you know, on uh, on institutions happen pretty frequently. So, if you could talk a little bit about what how that appeared in your discussions, that that, that would uh, be helpful. Well, we have already now, let's say, some instruments at our disposal, and we have used it in the sense that we have had some cyber attacks. We have been able to attribute the cyber attacks to specific uh, uh, subjects, and then we have uh, taken, uh, uh, we imposed sanctions on uh, uh, these persons. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, so in, in, on two occasions, we have sanctions uh, person entities which have used or abused the, uh, uh, the system. Um, same story uh, when we have received attacks coming from the territory of a specific country, we have issued statement uh, saying that this was coming from that country and we have asked the country in question to uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, take action uh, from that mm -hmm you and to make it sure that this would not uh, repeat itself. So already, I would say we are on the reactive side. We have already developed instruments uh, uh, that, let's say, allow us to respond to this. But as I said before, I think that we need to be able to also to prevent uh, these kind of things to happen. And that's, I would say, much more difficult and much more complex because certainly 
we cannot use the same instruments that uh, uh, the cyber attackers are using uh, against them. So we cannot, uh, um, so we have to find a, a, a way uh, that is compatible with our standards, with our behaviors, mm -hmm. with how we want to be, with the kind of society that we want to be. But at the same time, as I said, trying also to uh, uh, avoid that uh, uh, this is becoming then an element of fragility for our societies. Like we have done with the economic coercion. I mean, somehow we have uh, created instruments that are allowing us to, uh, let's say, to counter uh, actions that are taken uh, let's say, to, to, to create an economic coercion. And, that, and, and to use them uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to this. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I know we are over our time, so I want to thank you very much uh, for, for everything that you've done here. I'll, I'll give you one final option, and that is if, if you could have two lines you want my Washington colleagues to take away from this discussion, what would they be? Um, <laughs> Together we are more secure, and uh, uh, I think that it's uh, uh, the common work is uh, uh, what it matters. And if there are uh, um, uncertainties, if there are um, um, elements that we need to clarify, let's sit and talk mm. because I think that we can uh, find a way forward. Well, I appreciate that you've had the opportunity to join us and for this talk, and this has been extraordinary. I have very many jealous friends who are, uh, are listening in and wishing that they were ha being able to have this, this discussion with you. Thank you for giving us such a good insight into the EU's strategic compass and the discussions that are going on and the ongoing discussions that I'm confident that, that both the EU and the US and NATO will be having as partners facing real challenges and a real to-do list. So thank you very much indeed. I appreciate it. Thanks to you, Robin. Thanks to the, uh, uh, to the Wilson Center. Thanks to Duncan. And uh, thanks to all our listeners who uh, have been with us uh, uh, tonight. Thank this you. afternoon for you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.